Hey guys, Connor Richards of Poker News here at the 2024 WSOP in Las Vegas, and this is Life Outside Poker. My guest for this episode is Norman Chad, who's one of the most recognizable voices in all of poker, and that's because he spent more than two decades as a color commentator for the World Series of Poker. He's been there for many of poker's biggest moments, including Chris Moneymaker's 2003 victory in the main event. He also had a career as a sports columnist for the Washington Post and a brief stint as a stand-up comedian. Let's get into it. All right, Norm. Well, thank you so much for coming in nice and early today and doing this interview. I really appreciate it. I understand Men the Master canceled, and I have no problem filling in. Yeah, well, that is a controversy that happened this summer that we can talk a bit about, but I want to talk to you about all sorts of things, your sports writing career and, of course, your long broadcasting career. But let's go back a little bit because we have something in common. We both worked for our college newspapers while we were in college. So what, what was your college newspaper experience like? Uh, probably better than yours. We had a better paper. Uh, we had a better reputation. Uh, but actually, the, my, I went to the University of Maryland. And if I had not worked at the college paper called the Diamondback, my Maryland experience actually just would have been pretty empty and miserable. Uh, oh, loved really? working at the paper. It absorbed a lot of time. It actually cost me, I, it took me five and a half years to graduate in Maryland. And back then, Maryland was not difficult. Uh, you just had to pretty much add two plus two. And he had a degree, but since I was so absorbed with the paper, uh, I missed like a whole semester working like 60 hours a week for the paper. So I didn't oh. even go to class. So it took me an extra year and a half to get out of Maryland. How'd you first get involved with the paper? Were you into writing in high school or anything like that? Yeah, I started as a sports writer as a, at my high school paper. And then I worked for the local county weekly as a junior and senior. And then I was lucky enough because the person who ran the, the sports center of that county weekly was also the high school sports editor of the Washington Post. Wow. So he would bring in college students from Maryland and American University and George Washington University to work at the Post. So my freshman year at Maryland, I was covering high school games for the Washington Post and decided to wander over to the college newspaper to work there as well. I mean, that's pretty crazy to be that young and be writing stories for the Washington Post. What, what was that like for you at such a young age? It, it, you know, it seemed to come naturally. Uh, I grew up with the Washington Post. It's obviously a great paper. When I was in college, it was not that many years after Watergate. So to walk into the Washington Post newsroom, which is replicated perfectly in all the presence men, was really a thrill. You know, to see Bob Woodward, to see Jason Ro uh, not Jason Robarts, who plays I'm sorry to see. Uh, Jason Robarts, I keep thinking, is now the executive of the Washington Post. To see Ben Bradley, who yeah. had quite a presence, it was a thrill. But again, I'm, I'm essentially answering phones as the equivalent of a production assistant, uh, editorial assistant, and I'm covering high school games where you write eight paragraphs like in 20 minutes after the game, and you phone it. Back then, this is pre-internet, you go to a pay phone at the, at the closest 7-Eleven and hope that somebody isn't making a drug deal that night on the phone, and you get onto the phone and you dictate your story. That's so crazy. And uh, I've done a couple internships, nowhere like the Washington Post, but... When you're that young and kind of new to journalism, sometimes you make mistakes. Do you have any stories of, I don't know, when you made an error as an intern or an embarrassing moment, life lesson? You know, my, my most embarrassing moment at the Washington Post came when I was older. It, it came uh, when I was about 27, 28 years old, and it's really embarrassing. I, I, I joked about Men the Master uh, canceling here. The Washington Post had me cover the World Cup before it was a big deal in the U.S. in 1986, uh, which is the year that uh, Maradona scored the hand from God goal. Mm -hmm. So I went there just because so many other people turned it down. You know, I, I just they did, the World Cup was not a big deal. Soccer was not as big a deal in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I went there and I enjoyed that. I was in Mexico City for five weeks. But on the hand of goal business, I didn't see that it was the hand of goal. I, I must have I had to take a look at it. But I must have written the worst sports news story in history. Since this was, you know, it's like the missing of Babe Ruth, you know, called his shot in 1914 or whatever. Yeah. I didn't know it was the hand of, uh, hand of God. I just thought it was a goal that was somehow controversial. So that was a pretty bad screw up. And uh, that pretty much sent me into the poker world, I think. No, that came later. So uh, that, that was my worst screw up. As a young, as a, when, I was in high, uh, when I was doing it in college and stuff, I had no major screw ups. So you mentioned that uh, you wouldn't have had as good of a college experience without that paper. What do you think... What path do you think he would have gone down if, if not for sports writing? Well, the path I was going to go down, I knew in college. I figured out 
when I was covering games, especially towards the end of the season when the Baltimore Orioles, say, were out of the pennant race, they did not send their staff writers there. So as a, as, as a college student, I got to cover some NBA games. I got to cover some MLB games. And I always thought I was going to want to be a sports, like a, what we call a beat writer, covering a Major League Baseball team, covering an NBA or NFL team. But when I got the experience of covering these Baltimore Orioles games and saw how miserable the day-in, day-out experience is for a sports writer, I mean, you got to really love it. As you love sports to begin with, you love writing. But it's, it's first of all, it's bad travel. You, 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 like you go to a new city, but you go from airport to car rental to hotel to stadium, back to hotel, back to airport. Okay, you're not exactly traveling and seeing museums. As far as the game goes, Connor, you know, you're writing on deadline back then. They're, the games are at night. You go in there at six o'clock. Uh, you get ready to do the game. You watch the game. You then go into a locker room with half-naked men and ask them stupid questions as they're coming out of the shower. You then come back up and you write your story as quickly as you can and you finish at midnight or 12.30 and all you want to do is either eat a steak or drink 12 beers. And you do it again the next day. It didn't seem to be a great lifestyle to me. And my other interest was uh, comedy writing and stand-up comedy. So I decided when I was in college that I was going to become a stand-up comedian. <laughs> <laughs> mistake so yes coming out of the university of maryland i worked as a stand-up comedian uh for about two years uh what's the stand-up scene like in dc or wherever you were doing it uh not it wasn't again this is not new york or los angeles and this is before the the comedy club explosion where stand-up clubs went all over the country a lot so this is the very beginning of it so it wasn't a big scene there were two comedy clubs uh i, I got a job at one working as a busboy and then as a waiter so i could go to the shows yes. and i met a lot of comedians that we started playing a poker game with all comedians uh at night so it was not a big scene i didn't travel much because i wasn't very good and when i did travel and got, got paid uh people did not get their money's worth do you remember any of your bits from those days that went over well or maybe not so well the two things I remember most is inexplicably, inexplicably, my closing bit would be an impersonation of a Siberian Husky. We, I grew up with Siberian Huskies. An impersonation of a Siberian Husky who was smoking weed. And I would, you know, get into character and walk out like the Husky and, you know, take a, I start talking about, like the Husky would be talking about, oh, I love the, you know, I love banging that Shetland sheepdog. And it was just really bad. Okay. The other thing I remember is because I did get professional gigs and I was hosting a show at a, a local bar that was on a comedy club. And one night it had one of those old exposed brick behind you, which was very popular. And one night, some, the crowds were like 30, 35 people. One night, someone threw a, an egg at me. Oh, wow. Now, when I thought about it long enough, nobody brings an egg to a comedy show. Okay, so this was like a setup. It was like rigged. Someone with, you know, it's like my sixth or seventh week working there. Somebody in the restaurant, somebody in the kitchen, one of the waiters or waitresses was tired of me. And they, the, 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 the egg came from within the club. Someone wasn't bringing a club to throw the egg at me. By the way, it missed me and it splattered on me. And that was the biggest laugh I got that night. Hey, well, any laughs, any laughs will do, I guess. Uh, you mentioned that you got into some poker games with comedians. Is this where poker became a part of your life? Uh, the poker becoming part of my life was after it, it came part of my life at the University of Maryland, and all you know, we just started playing poker. I, I had never played poker before college, and we just started playing a twenty-five cent limit game with all the home games you played back then. Uh, obviously, nothing resembling no limit hold'em. Yeah, you know, wild card games, Jack's Open, uh, you know, Black Mariah, whatever that was, Follow the Queen. So that's where we played. We went from twenty-five cent limit to fifty cent limit to one dollar limit over the course of three or four years. And those were great. We played once or twice a week all year long. You mentioned no no limit hold'em. It's very well known that you do not like no limit hold'em. You much prefer mixed games. Why is that? Well, it, it's not so much, and I, I don't like no limit hold'em. Part of it is I don't like to play it, and I'm not very good at it. Maybe if I was better at it, I would like it. But the idea that most of the clubs right now, most of the card rooms, that's all they play. It there's there's other games. So there's a lot of other games. And so I, I don't like the fact that some people just only play one game all the time, and it shuts out the opportunity for us to play Stud, Omaha, and all the other games. But I just enjoyed the, the variety. You know, when I, when, I, when I go to a card club, if I'm playing just one game, if they have a two-game or five-game mix, I prefer it because I like to mix around. Uh, I'm going to be playing a horse today. 
That's just five games. The next tournament I play, if it's stud eight, I miss the fact that we're not playing five games in a row. So it's not so much a dislike for No Limit Hold'em, uh, even though I don't know why people don't get bored looking at two cards at a time. And also, if you're a recreational player, Connor, you know, you want to play hands. Yeah. If you're playing No Limit Hold'em anywhere close to decent, you're going to be mucking most of your hands. But in these other games, you get to see more hands. You get to see more flops. So it's more enjoyable as an amateur player to play all the other games. Do you have a favorite game or a game that you consider your best game? Uh, well, the games I play on a, on a daily basis or two or three times a week are is an Omaha 8 stud 8 mix. So I assume those are my best games because I play them so often. But I like, you know, I like what they call the carnival games. You know, I learned to play the carnival games during the pandemic in my first foray into an online atmosphere with just a bunch of people who know each other. So I learned to play, you know, the Badoogie, Badesi, Badusi. Drama, ha, Deuce of Seven, Drama, ha, Drama Doogie. Drama Doogie was better than my second honeymoon. Drama Doogie is just really fun to play. So I like all the other games. We played 21 or 22 games. Yeah, I, I'm also a, a pretty big fan of mixed games, uh, but they're pretty difficult to, to find. They don't really get spread that much in Vegas and probably not other places as well. Uh, where can people play mixed games? Is it just kind of like a home game thing? Yeah, they, I'm, I'm hoping that there's a movement towards them. Heck, I thought PLO would become much, much more popular 10 or 15 years ago, and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Now it's coming. And then this year we had Big O, which is five cards instead of four cards playing Omaha. Yeah. The first time at the World Series with two, two different tournaments. It's hard to find, except at the, at the nosebleed levels. And we don't, you know, the, the biggest mixed games play all those things. But those are games are like 200, 400, 400, 800. It's hard to find them at, you know, 4, 8, yeah. 10, 20. And I don't find them hardly anywhere. So even in, when we try to start like a horse mix game, the problem is that most people, it, you get it going at the beginning, then people start walking on two or three of the games, and the game dis, disintegrates yeah. pretty quickly. So it's hard to find them. I know Hustler in Los Angeles does a couple of days a week where they have a 20-40 mix with 10 or 12 games. Everybody picks their own game, and, and that's fun. But it's really, really hard to find, as you said. You mentioned that you play a couple times a week. Is that in Los Angeles, or where do you play? Yeah, I play at Hollywood Park, uh, which is near the airport mm. in Los Angeles on the west side. And that's where I, that's the first time I walked into a card room in Los Angeles. I'd been living in Los Angeles several years and did not want to walk into a card room for many reasons. Uh, the rake, uh, didn't trust the games, and smoking back mm -hmm. then was uh, legal and all. So it was, it was a bad atmosphere. So I lived in Los Angeles for seven years before I walked into, a, until I walked into Hollywood Park. Uh, about 25 years ago, and I've been playing there for 25 years, and that's where we play the Omaha 8 stud 8. So you mentioned that uh, you also wanted to be a TV writer. Is that what brought you to Los Angeles? Yeah, it did. Uh, so I, I, after the comedy failed, uh, or I was getting married, that was a good idea. I was getting married for the first time, so I decided comedy was not going to be putting bacon on the table, and we liked bacon. Uh, I did particularly sexy Farber John's. Uh, so we, I decided I had to go, I was still working part-time at the Washington Post at the time. Mm. So they offered me a full-time job to come back. And that included being a sports television columnist, which is another thing, which reminds me of poker. I mean, it's just a weird thing. Why you're writing about sports TV, you're watching TV and writing about it. seems like a stupid job. Uh, perfect preparation for poker, just sitting on my couch and just making comments about other people. So I came back and worked full-time at the Washington Post. And then I got a job offer for a new sports daily that opened up called The National, uh, which was a big deal. Uh, but it went out of business after 16 months. So then after that, I took a job with Sports Illustrated uh, to write a column for them. And that would allow me to live anywhere I wanted to in the country. And I decided since that was only a once a week column that I would move to Los Angeles and try to write uh, television sitcoms, which is what I really wanted to do. So that's when I moved to Los Angeles uh, was when I got the job for Sports Illustrated which was get, working for Sports Illustrated was the worst decision I ever made professionally. It was just a terrible place for me. I was in and out in one year, and uh, if I could have, I would have been in and out in one week. It just was a bad fit for me. Talk about an experience like that, because I think, you know, that could be a lot, pretty demoralizing for a lot of people, because Sports Illustrated, prestigious publication, you'd already worked for prestigious publications, but how did you, I guess, bounce back from going somewhere for a year and realizing that it just wasn't for you? You know, I would argue, Connor, that writing-wise, sports writing-wise, I never fully bounced back. It was a very tough year. It was a bad fit where they told me, we're going to hire you, and just be, you be you. 
mm-hmm. you be you, because they I established a certain type of personality on the type of things I wrote. It was a humor columns, you know, with was we didn't call it snarky back then, but snarky humor columns. And so they said, You be you. So I started writing them. And they started saying, No, nah, we, we can't run that. That's no good. And I go, What's the deal? You told me to, you know, you be you. And they said, Well, we didn't know you were gonna be like that. <laughs> so anyway. So in the, the, the year I was there, I was supposed to write a column every week, uh, whatever, 48 weeks for the year. Uh, years are shorter than that. That's why we live longer if we only had a 48-week year. So I ended up only writing about 35 columns because they told me some weeks not to write. And of the 35 I wrote, only 26 appeared. Mm. And of the 26 that appeared, I couldn't even recognize half of them because of their editing process. They almost had like, it was almost like it was uh, in the Olympics, if you have five judges in gymnastics, and four of them give nine, 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 and the Russian judge gives you a three, then your score comes way down. Their editing process is I would go through all these different editors and all these different colors. Like you have the blue edit, the red edit, the yellow, the yellow edit. Again, this is before the internet. So after it was done like this, it's just like if I walked through a car wash, my clothes were going to look different. I didn't recognize what yeah. I'd written. They had so many edits. If one guy found a joke no good, they would take out the joke and leave in the punchline. And when I complained, they said, what are you talking about? You're in Sports Illustrated. So, yeah, it was a very, very bad year. And it, it affected my writing and my thinking. I'm kind of surprised that, you know, it'd be fine for the Washington Post, but Sports Illustrated would be like, hey, too, this is too much. Uh, what I found out, Connor, by the way, over the years when I've done any work for magazines, newspapers are a different animal. Newspapers, you know, are just get it in and get it out. Deadlines every day. You got yeah. you know, to fill that big, that big junkyard with all the stuff every day. The landfill has to be filled. Magazine editors, especially if it's a, one, a weekly magazine or a monthly edit, a magazine, they have a lot more time on their hands. So they have a lot more time to look at your stuff, lean back, you know, have a Jack Daniels peanut butter sandwich. You go, I'm going to change that. I'm going to change this. So now you take a look at it for all. Oh, I'm going to change that. I'm going to change this. So magazines were not my jam. Newspapers have always been my thing. And after all that failed, I ended up coming back, moving further down to return to a once a week newspaper column that was syndicated. When newspapers were dying, I know it was a stupid professional move, but I really enjoyed myself doing that. No, I, I totally understand. I got into journalism as well, and you said, you know, dumb career move with, how, with a dying industry, but uh, it can be really fulfilling. That, that's why I like writing. Uh, is that how you feel? Is, is writing a fulfilling pastime? Without question, Connor. And you know, and I've, I've seen you, you know, write pieces that are almost English uh, for poker news that look pretty good. So whatever I'm doing, whether I was doing sitcoms or stand-up comedy or newspaper columns or poker, it's, they're all functions of writing. Uh, even when I'm talking extemporaneously, there's preparation in terms of writing and stuff. So yeah, I love to write. So I've loved, as difficult as it is to write once a week at a good level, every week for 25, 30, 35 years is what, what I did. Yeah. I, it was hard to do. I love doing it. I miss not doing it since I stopped doing it a couple of years ago. So yeah, everything I essentially do is starts with the writing. The both the newspaper and magazine industries have changed so much and are in a pretty bad place right now. What advice would you give to like a young student or someone out of school who wants to be a sports writer, sports columnist? Uh, Mary Rich, you, you got no. It's it's tough now. You know, there's it's it's weird, Connor. There's there's more opportunity everywhere particularly in the creative arts, anywhere in the liberal arts, because of the internet, because of, you know, if you're writing TV, it used to be three networks. You can never get in there now. Now there's, you know, all these cable networks. Now there's live streaming. Now you can do anything you want. You can put your own show. I mean, that's how uh, 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 Issa Ray got unsecured on HBO, which was a great show. They did, she was just doing her own little 15-minute things mm. on YouTube, and somebody saw her and said, oh, let's try to do that. So all the opportunities are out there in writing. You know, we can go, we can go out into the, to the Paris garage right now and say, all right, let's, let's start a website. You and I, let's just start writing. Problem is that there's not much revenue there, uh, and you've got to make your own way. So even though there's more opportunity, it's much more difficult to make a living. So you gotta, you, I mean, you got to roll up your sleeves and have more desire than even we did because it's just hard to break through. And, you know, anybody can start a website. Anybody can do a podcast. <laughs> like, what are we talking Seriously, about? Seriously, anyone. Talking about it? It's incredible. I mean, they just picked you out of the line of a Best Buy and said, come on, come on here. You know, Poker News is short. Oh, you can talk? You can do a podcast. But anyway, it, 
It was me or John Sofen. Oh, you were John Sofen. Oh, my goodness. If it's a fire hydrant and John Sofen, you're going to teach the fire hydrant five words and say, go. Anyway, it's tough out there. So you start a podcast, you start a website, and you just keep doing it. You keep knocking on doors, and it is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah, would you advise someone to go into something like that? Because, like you said, it's really fulfilling, but there's not really money in it. You know, if it's, I would not. I want them to. But I know I used to speak, uh, I had a friend of mine, uh, Jay Adande, really good sports columnist in Washington, Chicago. He's been on Around the Horn uh, on ESPN many, many times. And he used to be, a, he was a visiting professor of sports journalism at USC in Los Angeles. And he'd have me come in once a year to talk to the class. And I think the fourth, after the third or fourth time I came in, I think my vision was too dark. I was discouraging them too much. And besides discouraging them, I was telling them how hard it is to do it the right way because standards have really lessened. We have less editors. We have yeah. just less mainstream where you have, you have a chain of people that would protect the process of gathering information. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't even happen at the biggest levels like at Fox News and MSNBC. They just have their track. We're going to report this as fact. We're going to report this as fact, even though the fact is somewhere in between. Yeah. So the whole process is bad. The whole process is tough. And I was telling them that. I think he told me to stop coming in because I was discouraging them. But for, I mean, we need journalists and more regular journalists than sports journalists. You know, I don't care if we don't have somebody to, to report that somebody beat somebody else four to two, you know, in a double A game. But the democracy hangs on the free flow of information otherwise that's untainted that we can trust. And too many small markets now, small cities, are losing that one newspaper they had, even though it was a weekly. So where are you going to find out your information? Where are you going to find out what the city council is doing, the mayor is doing, the police department? You need journalists. So I encourage people to be journalists. Sports writers, not so much. Yeah, even the yeah local news is, is definitely needed. But yeah, it's difficult. That's what I was doing before Poker News is I was a local government reporter in Utah. And it's fun covering city council meetings. But yeah, there is very few people doing it. And Seemingly less and less all the time. It's, it's almost like a public service, as we call journalism, the fourth estate. It's, it's, it, I wish it was protected more because uh, just to, you know, not to, to wax poetic about the democracy, but Thomas Jefferson had a famous quote, you know, given the choice of uh, a government without newspapers and newspapers without government, I'll take the latter. You need that information flow to keep everybody honest, keep the, you know, hold people's feet to the fire. So it's, it's, it's not sexy work to be covering city council meetings in Utah, but it needs to be done. And it's not, it doesn't pay very well. Just like teachers don't pay very well. They should pay well, better. Fire department should pay better. Police department should pay better. But in our culture, it skews away from that. But we need it. We need it desperately. Yeah, well said. Totally agreed. Uh, so in addition to column writing, you also wrote a book in 1994. Uh, what was that like? What was it like writing a book? And how is that different from daily newspaper writing? So it was a, it was a faux book because it was, it, was, it was probably 40 or 50 columns, okay. musings on sports TV, and half of them would have been published already, and I might have nice. knocked them up. I wrote 15 or 20 other ones, which it's hard to write without deadlines. So yeah, I get into a rhythm. Uh, if I'm writing weekly or three times a week, you get into a, uh, just a routine and a rhythm of you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down. So to have to write another 20 pieces was hard, but the book wasn't that hard. All, you know, all the pieces are, are like, say, you, you read them on the toilet. They're all like three or four minutes to read. You read them on the toilet. You know, then when you flush the toilet, you may take the page out of the book and flush it down the toilet uh, was whatever else you put into the toilet. So I enjoyed it. Uh, it didn't sell very many books. Uh, it was called Hold On, Honey. I'll take you to the hospital at halftime which was based on a true incident with my first wife when she had a medical emergency. And I was watching a Pittsburgh Steelers game that was rather important at the time. Uh, I was approaching the playoffs, and she told me she was having, I think, a stomach problem, and it was getting worse and worse in the kitchen, and it was like a minute 30 left in the first, second quarter. And I said, okay, we just if they don't make this third down, we'll go right now. But if they make this third down, just so we'll wait 10 or 15 minutes to see if they score. That did not directly lead to her leaving, <laughs> but she did leave seven or eight months later. Might have had something to do with it. Eh, yeah, I don't even think it was in her top five of, li of reasons why I have to leave this house today. Hey, forever memorialized in that book title. Uh, well, most people know you from your uh, poker broadcasting career. You're one of the most memorable voices in poker, going all the way back to the 2003 moneymaker victory, one of the most memorable poker moments. How did that come into your life? How did you get that gig? 
uh, I try to tell the story to answer less, but it's improbable uh, because I was not a poker player and I wasn't a broadcaster then. So I was, as other than doing some, my sports column, I was doing some other work for ESPN. Uh, and part of that was consulting with them. And part of that was going on there, like their shows, like pardon your interruption that they had before part of the interruption PTI. Mm -hmm. So sports writer talk shows, but then they were going to be doing poker for the first time. They, they decided they had, they had the rights to the world series of poker, but they never really used it. So they decided we're going to expand it this time. So the guy who hired me, who thought I was more of a poker player, asked me to consult with the production company that was going to do it. Independent production company, 441 productions. Uh, out of New York that was going to be doing poker for the first time. Mm. So he wanted to consult with them on, you know, stuff in poker, people in poker. And, you know, I, I knew something about poker, so I helped them as much as I could. And then about after doing that for six or eight months, they called me up and said, would you be interested in commentating poker for us? I thought it was a joke. I remember I said back to, I think it was Matt Morantz for 441. I said, sure, I would. You know, it's every little boy's dream from the time they're in third grade. To commentate on poker. What are you talking about? There is no poker on TV. They said, anyway, they were not going to use, the, you usually use a jock. You use an, uh, an ex-player, ex-coach in the league. Uh, you know, Frank Gifford, Dick Vitale, uh, whoever, Tim McCarver, so on and so forth. So they said, we're not going to use a player for several reasons. We're not going to use Phil Helmuth. We're not going to use the best name player. And we, in, in dealing with you, you make us laugh. And we like your sensibility. They had never met me. So I said, let me think about it. You know, I got off the phone. I asked my best friend later in the week about it. He said, what are you even thinking about? You got no career right now. You got to take it. I said, oh, that's a good point. So I ended up taking it. And that's how it happened. That they thought I had more poker experience than I did. And then just through conference calls and emails, write good emails. It gets you your next job. Through conference calls and emails, they decided to offer me the job, which was absurd. But I also thought Connor was just one, one year, I mean, one and off. I mean, it's poker on TV. What's it going to be? And we were going to be doing seven episodes of the main event in 03. And that's how it started. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Do you know, do you have any idea who else they might have been considering for the job or who would have? No idea. Uh, and, and, and it's funny because on the play-by-play -play thing, uh, they had done like they used to do like one, one hour or two hours of poker. So the previous year they had done two hours where they taped it and they, and the, you know, they taped the stuff and then they produced it afterwards, which is what we did the first few years. They did two hours with Lon McCarron and Gabe Kaplan. So Lon had done a little poker for them. Gabe had done a little poker for them. So they weren't considering Gabe, but they, they heard Lon on here and <laughs> don't know why. Lon wasn't even in the industry anymore. He was working part-time uh, as a voiceover guy and he was a mortgage loan officer at Washington Mutual. Oh, interesting. With bad interests that he was, I mean, he just, I would not go to him for a mortgage loan. Uh, they didn't even have, you know, sometimes they give you complimentary water, nothing. Uh, but they decided that he sounded good. I want them to go back and let, ha have them listen to him again and see if he sounded good. So they decided, he sounded good, so we'll use him. So they decided to use him. They decided to use me. I don't know who else they considered. I met him for the first time sometime during the main event of the 03 uh, World Series, and we've been together ever since. Yeah, that's a long relationship with him. Uh, do you consider him like a brother? What, what's that relationship like? No, actually, I like him more than my brother, uh, and I get along with my brother. Uh, it's been a great relationship. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard when you're in broadcasting, whether you are co-news anchors, whether you are hosting a morning, you know, morning radio show together, or whether you're partners in a broadcasting booth. You spend a lot of time with each other, in the booth and out of the booth. It helps a whole lot if you like each other and you get along with each other. We get along with each other for, you know, we, we've had, I've lost track of how many meals together. We've had like maybe 200, 250. He just paid for the third meal the other day of our 225 meals, which I was very impressed with. Uh, it was like a $35 bill. So anyway, we get along really, really well. And that makes it a lot easier when you're working with somebody that doesn't like you or you don't like them. It's very awkward and it's stressful in the booth. Lods made it very, very easy. So let's talk specifically about the 2003 main event when Chris Moneymaker one, it's interesting because you're doing the commentary. You're kind of weaving the narrative of his victory, but that's all after the fact, right? You, you said you recorded the commentary after he already won it. Yeah. Another funny thing about that, Connor. So I came before like a day or two before, uh, that started. And back then the, the main event was only five days or so. And I met the production people for the first time. So I met Matt Morantz who ran 441 productions. He took me upstairs 
second floor of Binion's, which is where the tournament was going to occur. As we were walking around, I said to him, where's our bar broadcast vantage point from? And he looked at me like I was from Mars. And I, I said to myself, well, I'm an idiot. I never use the term broadcast vantage. What's vantage point? You know, what am I doing? I go to Stanford or something? So I said, well, where are we doing the broadcasting from? And he said some version of, you can't be that stupid. We do none of it from here. We do all of it afterwards. That's how much of a newbie I was. I had no idea we did all of it afterwards. In fact, when we did those stand-ups at the beginning, which I was doing, I think, in T-shirts the first couple of years, those first group of stand-ups we did, we did them right after that night, after Moneymaker beat Farha. Like an hour or two later, we went over in front of a black curtain, and me and Lon did, they knew they were going to have seven broadcasts or something. We did seven stand-ups. They already had, like, essentially storybooked each show to what's going to be starting each show with. And that's when we did them. That's the first broadcasting I did was right after it ended. And wow. then we wait a few weeks or months until they edit all these things. And then we would go to New York and do it in, in a little booth in front of something the size almost of your laptop. You know, a little screen there. And Lon shouting. Well, yeah, yeah, that looks pretty good. When did you realize that a recreational like Chris Moneymaker winning was going to have a, a big impact on poker? Again, I was an idiot. As... I recall so vividly as it came down the stretch and then we lost Phil Ivey just before the, the final table. Oh, yeah, the nines versus eights. Yeah, when Moneymaker knocked him out and I was just, oh, that's not good. He's like the most legitimate guy here. So now we got, you know, nine stumble bums named Moneymaker. When Moneymaker was playing Farha, in my mind, we needed Farha to win. He, he had the Humphrey Bogart Hollywood gambler look. He was a professional gambler, a professional poker player. It would be ridiculous if some whatever accountant from Tennessee who had never played this event before was the world champion. So I thought Farhall had to win. I had no idea that there would be the moneymaker effect. I had no idea until after we started broadcasting him and they said, look at these numbers, that there would be a moneymaker effect. Wow. I still wanted Sam. I still to this day <laughs> want Sam Farha to win. Sorry, Chris. He slipped apart. Well, both Chris and Sammy are still active in poker. Sammy Farha actually just ran deep in something. Uh, I think yesterday. Uh, do you still keep in touch with either of them? Uh, Farha, no. Uh, who's a, 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 he's a constant presence on Las Vegas poker, playing cash bogey. He likes to play PLO. So I have no relationship with him. Uh, Chris, over the years, sure. Uh, Chris used to do a podcast. I've done his podcast. We've done a lot of stuff together here and there. I see him a lot. And Chris, as I've said since you know, year one or 04 then, I mean, this whole poker ambassador business is, is sort of trumped up and ridiculous. You know, they're here to play poker. If you don't want to be an ambassador the next year, you just want to play poker, go ahead and play poker. Chris had this mantle put on him. He was not a public person. He wasn't in that public persona. And he just grew into it. He's such a nice guy. He's such, you know, he's, he's the everyman that we love. He's so great with people that over the last 20 odd years, he's just been perfect in that role. So I love what Chris has done. He didn't have to do any of that, but I love the way he treats the people he plays with when he's playing with them. And we do see uh, different main event winners. Some of them are very public. Some of them take a step back, but it sounds like you don't think that they have any obligation to be an ambassador or be a public face of poker? No, no, I, I understand you know, poker is a different animal. So we always have, we have different standards than any other professional or sporting pursuit. You know, if Davis Love the third won the Masters, all right, Davis Love the third, you are the face of golf. What are you, nuts? And I'm, I'm going to the country club and having a drink. I mean, they don't do that in other sports. So we, we assign this poker ambassador to the, to the world champion, to the World Series of Poker main event winner. It's nice if they take it and run with it, and it's nice if they're good with the public, but if they, just, if they don't want to play another hand of poker, that's fine. I mean, it's their lives. Poker's a weird pursuit. Do as you must. And after Moneymaker, we mentioned poker really exploded, uh, especially the World Series of Poker, record-breaking numbers like in 2006 and things like that. What was it like kind of being there firsthand and getting to commentate on the poker boom? Uh, it was... It was weird, Connor. So, again, I didn't know much about poker. I still don't know much about No Limit Hold. By the way, I do virtually no strategy or analysis still when they put me in the booth to the disdain of uh, the disgust of many pokerati. 
So back then, like if I go back and, and see when they, they forced me once in a while to say something, like in 03, 04, 05, the amount of things I said that are beyond moronic is incredible to me. I've cut down on it a little now. But yeah, I didn't know what I was talking about. So it was nice to do it when we were doing it because this was something different. It was a new creative muscle. Uh, and once in a while, they'd stop me because, again, when we're taping it afterwards, we can, you know, we can do 53 takes of the same hand. We'd redo a whole hand if the producers thought you didn't have enough energy, you didn't emphasize this or that. But once in a while, they would stop me and go, all right, Norman, you know, let's just as a hand in segment three. Why don't we go back and retape that hand? And, you know, instead of that Mussolini reference, uh, why don't you tell us why uh, Under the Gun Plus Two raised with pocket tens in that spot? And I told him once the first time ago, first of all, I don't know why he raised with pocket tens in the TG Plus Two. <laughs> and second of all, more importantly, I don't give a damn. I don't care. You know, there's going to be another hand after it. Let's just concentrate on the people and what they're wearing and what they're saying. I don't care. I don't care how they're playing poker. And that's always been my general regard for it. So early on, that's what I did. And late on, that's still what I do. And I do think poker commentary over the years, it probably has gone more towards the analytical and less of the color commentary. What do you think's lost with that transition? Yeah. Viewers, life itself, humanity. I hate that transition we've made. Uh, I just think we're, we're, it's like we're in a bubble and we're, we're preaching to the choir. We're talking to a small audience that is really big on the, the, you know, the meta, the next level, the GTO, the merging of ranges. The casual audience is what grows the game. And the casual audience doesn't want to hear that. They want to follow the money. They want to root for this guy or root against that guy. They want to be informed and entertained, but I don't think they, if you want to grow the game, the strategy part, I think is the wrong way to go. I think you have to, to build the characters of the game, let, let, let us know who they are. And even though it's harder to do with the, the younger guys who grew up with laptops playing online than it is with the older guys who would seem we have more, a more gritty background, all, everybody has stories. And so even the, the guy you wouldn't think would have a story, if you dig deep enough, you'll find out something about them that's incredibly interesting, and you hang your hat on that. So that's the way I think you go as far as going this other way, which doesn't include me. And I don't say this out of self-interest, because you know I can walk away tomorrow, and I can work at Best Buy tomorrow, and I'll be goddamn happy at it, as long as the customers don't bother me. It's just like, just have a good safe shift and get to go to lunch. I'm happy. But I just think it's the wrong way to go. We need to open it up more to let people see the players and have characters and be more entertaining than more poker specific. Who are, who are the most entertaining poker characters that you remember over the years? Well, you got to remember uh, early on. So you have the, the, the old guard, which goes back to like the Texas road days, you know, mm -hmm. like Doral Brunson's the Texas road days, TJ Cloutier, just looking at him, you know, you know, uh, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, TG went all in. All right, let's just do it. You know, they, they, and they just had, they had great stories about playing poker in the '60s and '70s. When it was a lot harder. Yeah. So those characters are my favorite. The the, the older ones, you know, Amarillo Slim, Doro Brunson, TJ Cloutier, you know, Billy Baxter. It, when you have Billy Baxter on a podcast, yeah. I guess you could ask him a question, and then for the next two hours, he will tell you twenty five of the most interesting, entertaining stories you've ever heard in your life. So those guys, I love. But then you had other players who understood, and one of the first, uh, it was Danny Negreanu, who in his 20s, just like Devilfish Oliot in England, understood that it was more than just about the cards, that there was an entertainment factor. Both, forget television to begin with, that if you're playing with them, you want to make all the other players comfortable. If they're going to lose, they want to lose while they're having a good time. So Daniel understood that. Devilfish Oliot wasn't as pleasant to other people at the table, but he understood that the television element of it, that you've got to make it into a show. So people, they both understood that early on, and I give them credit for that. Mike Sexton, by the way, another great storyteller, the late great Mike Sexton, he understood the power of poker in the future if it was made into a show like the World Poker Tour. And if you, you, you know, had the, all the lights and all the money in the middle, and there was marketing and branding possibilities for poker. So those guys were all pretty smart. And then we, you know, we had the internet generation which just the online generation, which didn't care. I mean, when they came into a, a live card room, which was rare, uh, they didn't care who was around them. And it's what I call it, you know, headphones, hoodie, shunt, shades. I used to go up and tap on the shoulder. Hello, 
Hello, these are people around you, human beings. Say hi, say hi. They gotta look at me like, you're, you're the old man who does that shit. Get away from me. But, you know, that needed to change to grow poker in a card room. You don't wanna come in and play against, if I'm a ref, I don't wanna play against eight guys in hoodies and sun and shades who are having GTO conversations. It's a social game. If you're gonna beat me, at least, at least acknowledge that I exist. Sometimes they'll talk about you like you're not even there. Can you believe you pushed with that hand right there? I mean, that's an idiot. I mean, where'd they find this guy? 7-Eleven parking lot? I, this, this is retro. And it was obvious when my range was. I'm like, Whoa. That's what we have to avoid. Yeah. Uh, we were talking before this interview that you've done other cool commentary things. There was like a, a private party at the Bellagio that you were hired to commentate. What are some of your favorite commentary gigs that you've gotten over the years? Ones that stand out? You know, I have, first of all, as far as gigs that we would know about, I have an exclusive World Series of Poker for 20 years. So I don't do any other stuff on TV that I can't even recall. I might be for, forgetting one or two things. And then you do get, besides the charity events, you do get people who want to have you come by. And whether it's a large group or it's a small game, like uh, I'm often uh, auctioned off at a charity for you can get a home game with Norman, where he comes by your game, he deals, and he just, I love doing that. The one where I come by and I deal for 10 people and then I just make fun of them for three hours is my favorite thing to do. It's just, it's my element. And, you know, just why I love playing live poker. You're doing a lot of BSing with each other. You're having a good time. So those are my favorite things to do. The, uh, the larger ones where you announce and stuff are private things. Those are okay, but they just go by for me. Uh, I've done a couple of those with Lon. I do a couple of those by myself. But I love the, the, the private game where you, I, I love the deal. And I don't deal well, but I love the deal, and they don't care if I'm making mistakes. So I love the deal, and I love to interact with the other people. Those are the favorite things to do. And what are, your, what are some of your favorite WSOP broadcasting moments? One of my favorite is the Phil Hummuth Queen 10 hand, because your commentary on that was just so good. With you playing off of him saying, he called me with Queen 10 honey and all that. Uh, yeah. You remember that one, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, I do. You know I, you know, I didn't know Phil back then. And again, some of the people that I broadcast back then who I've been critical of, I've gotten, you know, I've gotten fond of them, and I'm still critical of them. I'm still critical of Phil all the time, or Mike the Mouth. I'm just more sympathetic to him. Uh, but with Phil, I always claim, and he doesn't need it, that I should kick back minimum 10% of my salary uh, because of what he does for the game and how enjoyable it is to have to deal with his rants and raves, and when he's out of control and out of line as well. I don't want to be out of control, out of line. You gave one where he's not out of control, out of line. He's just, he's being Phil. You know, like, you know, you can't even spell poker type of thing where he's talking to his wife. And that, it's just so much, he just, it's just so perfect. You can't write it any better. He, he is just so, it, it, I used to, it, back in the day when Mike Tyson was his fiercest, I would say if you were walking by a television in a, a bar and you saw Tyson in the ring, it doesn't matter who he's fighting, you would stop and look up there for a minute or two because he had that presence. If I'm walking by a TV set and, and Helmuth is playing poker, I stop and watch because something's about to happen. He's always something's about to happen. And I'm joyful that something's about to happen because he makes it easier for all of us. But he also, you know, he's like that off of TV. People think a lot of people do stuff for the TV cameras without question. Television changes everything. When you put the camera on somebody, you put it on your home. If you're, you, know, you wake in the morning, you're going to act differently. You put it in a courtroom. It changes testimony. I swear people are different when cameras are around. Phil is that way with or without the camera. He's always been that way. He's always been the poker brat. He can't take losing, uh, which is ridiculous at this point. He's approaching 60, and you think he'd get used to the bad beats. He's always yeah, got the thanks. best hand. If you go in with the best of it, I used to tell us to Phil, and you're always going with the best of it, aren't you? Because you play fairly tight. Then you're going to take the bad beat. You're not giving bad beats out. They're giving you bad right. beats. How are you not used to it by now? You've been doing this for 40 years. Another one that I love is uh, Mike Matisau and Sean Chacon going at it. And I can't remember what year that was. Oh, it was early. It yeah. was early. They're at the same table. And they went out of a lot, uh, like what Helbeth went out with Sam Grizzle the year before. And that was a great way. You might be talking, it was at that hand where, in, in, and when the flop came down. Yeah, and he stands up from the table. Sh Sh Chacon was out of the hand. And yeah. He just, yeah. Man, like he hit the flop. And like, you can't do that. And then, yeah. Oh my, yeah, and you called him out for it, right? You said he was out of line. Yeah, you, you can't do that. And I, I see that happen when I'm playing cash right now. People do that once in a while. And uh, I've seen it in tournaments once in a while. You, 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 the mouth was right right there. 
Uh, I thought they might come to blows, uh, just like with Jeff Lissandro with Antigate. I thought he was actually, you know, I'm not to block off to Prohoff Friedman. I thought they might come to blows over that that stupid Annie that uh, Prohoff claimed Jeff did not put out. Yeah, he had put it out, by the way. So we need we need more poker clips like this. We need more of these classic moments. Uh, we do, and it's it's hard to get them. Uh, and I, it's, that's like, I can't figure out, you know, how we fix America, which is much more difficult. Yeah. Uh, cause we're in a position where uh, we've never been in this position before. How do we, you know, how do we put that genie back into the bottle? So poker wise, again, the, those are the moments I always claim to find the game, what people we're talking about it right now, that you always have another hand coming up and you have some spectacular hands over the years, but the moments around the hands, the, in, the, the intersection of the players, the conflict between the players, that's what people always ask me about. Yeah. You know, and they're always you know, they're asking about, they don't remember Alex, Alex, Alex's name, Alex Power's name. But remember that Jack High guy? You call me with Jack High, you know, or Queen High. You know, that's the stuff they remember. And that's the stuff that brings people back to the table. That's the entertainment portion of the game. So when that flows naturally, that's really good. I don't like it when it flows artificially. And so some of the poker TV we've created is it's going to be artificial. Like they're almost like game shows. Uh, and even, uh, the, the wonderful thing that GG Poker put on last year. Uh, Game of Gold. Game of, Game of Gold. It doesn't reach out to the public as much because what they're talking about in, in the three of them watching the other guys usually poker related. But this is, again, a, a step in the right direction where you just you get more of the, the personality of the players in the game and you learn more about them, what they're like. Uh, that's the direction we need to go in. But I, I like it when it comes organically and naturally, not in an artificial type of setup we do. Yeah. And so... The WSOP was on ESPN for a really long time, and then in 2021, it went to CBS. What do you think the impact of that was or will be? Uh, on that, if you, when you leave ESPN as a programmer in the sports world, as many different leagues have found out, you want to come back to ESPN General. They have the largest imprint. They have the largest audience. So I think poker has been hurt by going from ESPN to CBS Sports Network just in terms of total viewers. ESPN is a larger cable network. They have a lot of programming around whatever they're doing. So you go to ESPN more naturally than you go to CBS Sportsnet. So we, we, we also lost all the reruns that you would get at 3 o'clock in the morning, which people would be yeah. grazing, and they'd say, oh, look at that, and they, they stick with it for a while. So we, we, because of this, we've, we've sort of hurt the World Series of Poker in terms of keeping it in the mainstream. So this, the, I don't think the contract has been the kindest it could be to the World Series of Poker. Because, you know, ESPN and the National Hockey League's left ESPN, I think, twice and come back. Mm. It's you just when you leave ESPN, you go elsewhere and it looks good. But ESPN is, is where all the all the all the pies and cakes are baked. Are you hopeful that it'll make its way back to ESPN? Yeah, I'm hopeful we, we have a more mainstream provider. Uh, I, I wish that CBS Sportsnet would promote it to some degree. They don't. Uh, so if you make it back to ESPN, and it's, that's, I, would, I guess that's unlikely. Uh, I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. But it, it, just, we, we, it would be nice if the World Series of Poker, it's, it's like a sleeping giant to me in terms of the mainstream. We were in the mainstream for a good while when ESPN was doing all those reruns and, and showing it every year. And now with the game still growing, as we could see from the numbers, we're no longer in the mainstream. So people don't necessarily, the casual viewer doesn't necessarily know that it exists as they did in previous years. That is interesting that, yeah, there's record high numbers in poker, but it's also outside of the mainstream. How do you reconcile that, that it's kind of like an all-time high, but also out of the mainstream? Yeah, it's amazing. First of all, Connor, if we go back to Black Friday and losing online poker in America, an incredible, you know, that's a knockout blow for poker in America. And we, we survived that, but we lose a lot of people there. What that tells me is that, and I've said this before, is that poker can take, it's, it's, it's strong enough to take an incredible amount of blows to the head and to the gut because we lost online. And we just didn't lose them to players, who, you know, the pros who then moved to Canada or Europe to continue playing. We lost a really casual person who would just flick on online at 10 o'clock at night to play for 30 minutes, you know, one cent, two cent. You know, uh, especially senior citizens, it was just a companion for them. So we lost so much of that, and yet poker is has such a good foundation with its popularity. Still, people playing home games and kitchen games and card rooms and such. 
that it's it's strong enough to withstand the loss of that. It's strong enough to withstand the loss of ESPN. It tells you poker still is in a pretty good shape. And if we could get one good break, like online being legal again across America, which it's not, it's going to go state by state, which is a really slow process, which doesn't heal us. You know, you need California and New York. You're never going to get California. You, you know, I remember yeah. people telling me 10 years ago, we'll have California within a year or two. I go, oh, you're never going to get California. The, the tribal the tribal money is way too powerful. It's going to take a long time if you're lucky. So it just tells me poker is really healthy, despite the fact that we need to fix some things and we'd be a lot, a lot healthier. We're really healthy, even though we continue to disenfranchise half the population. It's 5% of the people in a poker room are women. That's amazing how popular it is. And I have to check with me. Is it 8 billion, is it 8 billion uh, people in the world as of this morning? Sounds right. Okay, I'm guessing 4 billion are women. And I'm guessing a few of them would like to play poker. So, yeah, we're still in great shape, even though we have not solved that problem. Yeah. And uh, so we're filming this here at the 2024 WSOP. We're a couple weeks in. What are your impressions on this year so far? Uh, bathrooms are cleaner. Uh, bathrooms are very important. Uh, bathroom situation here is better than it was at the Rio. My impression is, again, I don't know about the real economy. You know, I don't trust government figures. I don't trust the left or the right. We've got problems out there. We've got inflation. We got, but the poker economy? What the heck? It's strong. The numbers this year here will be just as strong as last year. It might be up a little by the end of the year. And then, Connor, back in the day, you know, back when you were at Stanford, you know, they think Stanford's an Ivy League school. It's not an Ivy League school. It's nowhere close to being an Ivy League school. I think there's an Applebee's right outside the Stanford campus. Tell me it's an Ivy League school, please. Anyway, back in the day, all the other poker activity in Las Vegas just stopped for the World Series of Poker. It was a stupid business decision. Somebody decided at the win or Venetian, like between five and 10 years ago, well, we got all these people in town. Why don't we have series for people who aren't playing, you know, every day in the poker? So there used to be no competition for the World Series. Now, despite these incredible numbers for the World Series, every, you know, the Nugget, the Venetian, the Win, MGM Grand, Orleans, all have series that do really well. Where is all the money coming from? Okay, I don't know. But the poker economy is pretty darn strong. Yeah. Uh, so sticking on the 2024 WSOP, there was a controversy that you mentioned at the, at the start of this involving Men the Master win, where there was a, a shorted pot that he was involved in. It was a three-way all-in, and a player who tripled up realized that he'd been shorted. A lot of people are talking about this on social media, saying, hey, you know, Men has a history of controversial behavior, Something needs to be done about this. What's your take on the situation? Men does have a, you know, you, you could find a lot of people who tell you things that men have done over the years that are not uh, copacetic, or as we like to say in the neighborhood, not kosher. So that, let's say that's true. That doesn't mean whatever he did at the table the other day was wrong. We don't know. Yeah. And even when I watched the video of somebody else taking the shot and he's pulling chips back, there's a possibility that when he, he had everyone else covered, that sometimes when you go, when you have other people, you, go, you just you just shove in a, a large stack, and now he's taking back. Yeah, yeah. That's always possible, by the sure, way. Sure. Now, man doesn't clear. get the benefit of the doubt because of his history, but he's innocent here to prove him guilty. Yep. I'm just disappointed. I love the World Series of Poker. That, again, in this day and age, expression I don't like, that the security or camera system isn't such that it can, it can parcel this out within a few minutes upstairs. The truth of it is, and I've never been upstairs to where the eye in the sky is for any, any casino. I'd love to see it. I've seen documentaries about it. But I always think it's just like one camera, like in a whole casino, and there's a guy like this. Oh, what do you want me to check? Okay. I, I just, they can't cover all real estate at all the time, but I'd like to think that they could look at that as they look at other things, be able to decide and adjudicate it within minutes. Oh, he had the right amount out there. Oh, he took money out. We don't know. Uh, but that that sort of transitions into the whole issue of uh, when there is cheating in poker online and live, we simply have not been tough enough in the wake of it. You know, there, there are, there are, it's just like, if you can, if you commit a crime in real life, you know, don't do the, the crime unless you can do the time. When you commit a crime in poker, the penalties generally, uh, is, uh, there's no national federation or national federation. It's casino by casino. You do something wrong online, you can go play live. You do something wrong live, you go play online. That shouldn't be the case. We need to penalize it. And there have to be death penalty situations where you don't return the game. 
you know, if you're cheating, I, I don't understand how many, how many second, third chances you, you've got to get. So we need to find a way in which we punish the perpetrators better than we ever have before. Mm. Well, before we wrap up here, I just had some kind of more general questions. The first one is, with your sports writing career, broadcasting, what's your favorite project that you've worked on? My favorite project that I've worked on? Whether it's a column or a specific year of broadcasting. Yeah, my, uh, speaking of that, so my best work, actually, it's a long time ago now. My best work that I, I really loved was the 12 or 13 years I wrote an NFL picks column uh, against the spread. This is before gambling exploded, in which the, essentially the, the foundation of the column is all the experts have no idea what they're talking about. They'll, they're going to be right 50% of the time, no matter how they break it down. I can just flip a coin and do better than they did. And that's how I sold it to my editor. And we ended up, I ended up flipping a coin for 12 or 13 years, finishing over 50%. Wow. Uh, for that, that run. Better than I would have done myself because we, we just, it's hard. You can't beat the spread. So anyway, that work I did, besides the fact that I know I was right about these guys. There's still, by the way, analytics has gotten better. There are so few people that can that win in sports betting. Uh, poker's a much better investment. In fact, I interviewed Jimmy Vaccaro a few weeks ago for something else I was doing, the legendary sports book director. Long time at the Mirage. He's now at South Point helping out. And I asked him, what percentage of sports betters in your mind you know, part-time, full-time, what percentage of sports bettors are in the black? How many win? And he said less than 5%. And that's accurate. I'm sure he's, he's, he knows better than I do. So I love that I thought that correctly, but I love the writing in that column. I had to write, such as writing, instead of analyzing, I was writing jokes for all 15 games. And it's hard to do that 20 weeks in a row for 13 straight years. There's a lot of jokes, but I'm very proud of that work. That was my favorite thing I ever did professionally uh, next to the World Series of Poker, which has been terrific. Sounds like a lot of fun for sure. Um, so we talked about a lot of you know bad things, the state of journalism, the state of the magazine industry, but what's something that makes you hopeful in the world? <laughs> okay, on a personal level, uh, that my wife, Tony, has stayed with me for 17 years. That's yeah. a good one. She, as I told her she had to look at Bob Beeman, as you would maybe. I told her she Bob Beeman, the marital record for me when she got to year five. My previous uh, relationships did not last, usually longer than the third honeymoon night. So that makes, me, that makes me feel happy every day. My dogs make me feel happy every day. I love that I make their lives better and they make my lives better. And they're rescue dogs. Mm -hmm. And I tell them every day of the week, believe it or not, uh, that we rescued you, but you rescued me. They rescue you more than they I mean, you know dogs are just incredible. So those two things make me hopeful. But overall, with everything else out there, and I, I made a brief reference to before, that I don't know how we're fixing where we are. I don't know how we got to where we are. Uh, there's no middle. Mm -hmm. So you can't put the genie back in the bottle with Fox News and MSNBC. You, this, we've had polarization this bad before. Uh, people think this is worse as it's been. Uh, there's something called the Civil War. I think the Civil War is probably worse. Uh, when I was a kid, we had the Vietnam War and Civil Rights Movement. But yeah, it's, it's hard to be hopeful overall, except... I know there's enough, the good people exceed the bad people. And just as the good people can convince the bad people just to treat other people nice every day, it's that simple. You know, we, we, we get all roiled up with ethnic differences, religious differences, political differences. Uh, if you just, you know, if, if kind of, if you were born and on the day you were born, you were shipped to Belgium, you would be a Belgian and you would know everything about Belgium. And you wouldn't, you know, you, you'd love the Belgians. That, that's who you grew up with. Mm -hmm. But we, as Americans, we're, we're kind of isolated. So we have a fear of what we don't know. So the rest of the world, you know, what's Belgian? What's Bulgaria? What's Brazil? You know, what's the Congo? If you spent time there, then, oh, they're just like us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just trying to get to the next day. Just be nice to the next person. And then they'll be nice. And everyone pays it forward. And I, I sound like I'm on an infomercial now for something I'm about to sell you. But I, that's the only hope we have is we just could be a little nicer. And by the way, that would start with getting rid of poker Twitter, poker X. <laughs> I mean, X is a stain on all of us, but poker X is in the top 10 industries of being the, the, the most toxic X you can, you can find. I don't know what to do with poker X. Make yeah. it Y or Z. It's terrible. You know? I wake up in the morning and people are texting me. Did you see what Blaba said about blah blah about blah blah? I go, really? No, I don't want to see what Blaba said about blah blah about blah blah. 
So yeah, I'm hopeful if we just are nicer to everybody. And what's a piece of advice you would give to a younger version of yourself? Well, you know, one of the problems I've had in my life is when I, when I'm thinking of something that upsets me, I say it immediately or write somebody immediately about it. And my friends have always told me the old thing, you know, put it in the desk drawer, let it sit for three days, look at it again, and then see if you want to send it. I go, no, 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 no. When I'm pent up, I want to go out there and I'll take the, the, so, but using that on a personal level, when you're thinking of marrying somebody, put that idea in a drawer for three days, let it sit, take it out again and go, yeah, maybe we'll just go to dinner tonight. Uh, so that's, that's what I would tell my younger self because I had no plan to be married multiple times. So it's just, it's, you know, it's a stain on your record. You know, you're, if you marry a second time, okay. You know, once an accident, twice a trend, three times, you're an idiot. So yeah, I just wish I was only married one time in my life because just people walk around. I look, you're a seven time loser. But I'm not a seven time loser, like a two, two and a half time loser. That's what I would tell my younger self. Great advice. No doubt. All right, last question. Uh, Poker is a great game because it can kind of be a metaphor for so many different things in life or teach you so many different life lessons. So what is your favorite life lesson that can be drawn from poker? Uh, You know, it would be that people's character comes out at the table. So it's the thing about people act differently when they're winning a lot and they act differently when they're losing a lot. I can tell from the people who have character at the table if they're more even keeled. So it tests you obviously even more when you lose a lot than when you win a lot. So it's, it's easy to be the life of the table and friendly to other players when you're even you're ahead. When you're behind, not only is it best to treat other people as you would as you were ahead, but it also helps your game. It keeps you even keeled. When you go on tilt emotionally, then your game gets worse. So that's the, the one thing I learned from poker is to try to keep even keeled through thick and thin at the table and away from the table. So that and uh, at poker table, thank goodness, nobody carries a gun. So if we take the no gun thing at poker to the rest of America, my goodness, maybe we're just doing slingshots at each other or, or water pistols aren't bad. I hate water in my eye, but that's what I learned from poker too. Be even killed, win or lose, no guns. No guns. That's great. Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you, even though you hate Stanford, but I, I still think we had, so, we had a good time here. Okay, one of us had a good time. Uh, I double parked in, in case I was going to leave quickly because I was going to get upset at you. Uh, but yeah, I, just, I don't hate you know, Stanford. My father went to UCLA, so I don't like other Pac-10, 12. I see, I see. That's the, and then Stanford, you know, Stanford, Michigan, Duke, they act like they're Ivy League. I'm telling you, Connor, they're not. They're not. I don't like it's the true. Ivy League either, but they're not Ivy League. You're not Ivy League, all right? You're just a place with an Applebee's out front. Fair enough. Well, thanks, Norm. It was a pleasure.